emergency preparedness on the peninsula. That's the focus of this edition of Around the Peninsula. Hello everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson here at the Los Verdes Golf Course in Rancho Palos Verdes where the community, local leaders, and emergency planners all gathered at a special town hall meeting organized by Assemblymember Al Muratsuchi's office. During this meeting, important information was presented to help all of us be ready for when the next natural disaster strikes. Well, thank you everyone for being here. This is such a wonderful turnout. My name is Al Murasuchi and I have the privilege of representing the Palos Verdes Peninsula and the South Bay and the California State Legislature. I want to thank uh, each and every one of you uh, for uh, coming out today and I want to give special thanks to all of our elected officials from our four cities on the hill. Uh, we are happy that all four mayors from our cities are uh, here also joining us. And so, you know, we have um, our mayors and city council members. We have the LA County Fire. Uh, we have the Lomita Sheriffs. We have the California Office of Emergency Services and also a representative from Southern California Edison to uh, talk about, uh, you know, all the issues that, uh, that uh, we need to deal with in terms of being prepared uh, whether it's an earthquake or whether it's a wildfire. I want to uh, briefly share with you why I decided to do this. You know, I, uh, as your state representative, I uh, visited Paradise, California, which uh, some of you may know was the, the site of uh, the worst wildfire in California history, uh, especially in terms of the, the, uh, the number of deaths uh, and, the, and the overall property damage that was caused. And, uh, you know, it's called Paradise, California, but what I saw was more like hell. You know, I mean, the, the homes were burnt down. The only things that were still left standing were the, the, uh, the brick chimney uh, towers. And, uh, you know, as we went up and back from Paradise, California, we went up and down on these narrow two-lane roads, you know, one lane going each way. And it just reminded me of a conversation that I had with uh, uh, former Palos Verdes Estates uh, Councilman uh, uh, George Byrd, who once shared with me that, you know, uh, soon after I was elected, that, uh, that Palos Verdes is like an island with three bridges uh, leading in and out from the island. We have Hawthorne Boulevard, we have Crenshaw Boulevard, and we have PV Drive. And so, you know, when I heard especially about how in that incident in, uh, in, in Paradise, where there were so many problems, uh, not only in terms of uh, all, all the, of course, all the, the, the deaths and the property damage that was caused, but also in terms of the, the access uh, in and out of the community, as well as uh, the breakdown of communication from the, uh, the, the, the cell towers, the, the, the communication infrastructure basically melting down uh, and with uh, much of the emergency uh, information not being able to be communicated with the residents, I thought, you know, we need to have this town hall, especially he up here in Palos Verdes, because uh, surveying my district throughout the South Bay, again, from Palos Verdes up through Manhattan Beach, Palos Verdes is definitely uh, the, the most at risk uh, in, terms of a, uh, in terms of fires. So uh, without uh, uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, representative of the California Office of Emergency Services, Jenny Novak. Jenny Novak is uh, the Emergency Services Coordinator for the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, uh, where she recently served as Division Supervisor for Ventura County in support of the Thomas Fire. Uh, she is a specialist in emergency management and fire prevention, and in 2016, uh, Jenny was honored at the White House for her innovation and preparedness training development. So please welcome Jenny Novak. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here with you guys this morning in this beautiful place. And thank you to the assembly member for convening this type of meeting. What, what my intent is with this presentation, because I know we have a couple of um, local speakers as well, is to kind of give you a broad overview of the types of things our agency does, um, a few tips of preparedness and um, response and recovery tools. Um, from my perspective, having served in recent disasters, things that you can do now, um, what your role is, what our role is, and hopefully facilitate a better understanding of how this all works when we have these disasters. 
So um, some of the, the main tasks that our agency is given at the state level is maintaining the state's emergency plan. That's a document that is updated every three to five years or so when we have new lessons learned and we have new legislation passed that impacts our agency. Recently, you've seen a lot about alert and warning um, come through the state legislator, and that's a really important subject that I'll touch on a bit uh, today. Um, we also, whenever anything happens, which has been a lot lately, we coordinate the responses to major disasters. So that is a primary function of us. And, and typically, when that happens, we don't focus as much on preparedness anymore, and we go straight to response because it's a, an all-hands-on-deck type situation. So that's what we've been in for a while now. Um, and making sure that we're, the state overall is ready. Um, so we work with a lot of other state agencies primarily, um, like Caltrans and the Department of uh, Public Health, Department of Social Services, and try to coordinate emergency resources on the state level with those entities. Um, and then also, a lot of our funding comes from the federal government, and we, are, we help the local agencies make sure that they get access to some of that grant funding. So there's grants like the Emergency Preparedness um, Program funds that come down from the federal government, um, other types of funds for recovery as well as for mitigation that I'll speak about a little bit later. So we help to kind of facilitate some of that funding come down from the federal level. Um, and then, of course, assisting the local government. So this, this um, diagram right here kind of shows the way that we operate in the emergency management field here in California. You can see up uh, at the state level, so most of the coordination takes place in Sacramento at what we call our State Operations Center. Um, and then we are also divided into regions, which I'll go into a little bit later. Obviously, California is such a huge state um, that it's kind of hard for the state level to coordinate directly with the counties, which is why myself, as a regional representative, um, work closely with Sacramento and work closely with the, the counties here to make sure that that coordination can take place. And then um, we call them operational areas, but really what that is is a county. Um, so we have uh, all the counties, and then the operational area would also include cities or special districts in that county area. So we can consider all of that to be an operational area. And then you have local government, so cities. I heard there's some city representatives here today and other special districts that are considered at the local level. Um, and then the field. So we have our partners here from the fire department and um, of course their sheriffs and other uh, field personnel that would help to coordinate the actual incident itself um, as it's happening. So if it's a fire, those are the boots on the ground that are working to put out the fire. Um, but then we also do a lot of coordination behind the scenes as emergency managers to support uh, resources as well as information that might be needed in the field to get them uh, in a better position to be able to respond to whatever incident they're dealing with. Um, so we have emergency operations centers where we do that coordination and prioritization of resources and send that, those resources to the field to help the fire department um, or the police department depending on what type of incident it is. So that's kind of the structure of how um, we manage emergency response in the state of California. And here are the regions. So we have three administrative regions, and ours is here, Southern, um, and we cover a pretty large geographical area. We have 11 counties in the Southern uh, region of California, so um, we go all the way up to Mono County on the Eastern end, which, you know, it's sort of debatable, is, is that Southern California? But if you think about the way that resources can move throughout the state, for a good portion of the year when the Sierra Nevadas are covered in snow, it's much easier to access Mono and Inyo County from Southern California than it is from Sacramento, even though it's actually physically closer. Um, so we go all the way up to Mono on the east and all the way up to San Luis Obispo on the west. I often describe our area as kind of a giant U or a V shape because even though we have those counties, we don't have current county. Um, so there's another kind of geographical divide there with the mountains that separate Los Angeles from Kern County. And then within the region, we have a team of about 12 or so emergency services coordinators here in Southern California, and we divide up all the different counties and then act as liaisons with those counties. Some of us have more than one county. Um, I primarily work with Ventura and Inyo County. Um, so in Ventura, we've had a lot go on in the last couple of years. So that's some of the experience that the assembly mem member mentioned that I've been working with fire. So we work together as a team. We also have 
fire and law and tele telecommunications coordinators that are assigned to us in the southern region. So I'll talk a little bit about what our role is. This diagram here kind of depicts what um, you might hear referred to as the disaster cycle in the field of emergency management. So that's showing that it's kind of always continuously we're at some point in this cycle. And often, when there's not something happening, we are between preparedness and mitigation. And um, if you're not familiar with that term and how it's commonly used, mitigation typically refers to physical measures that you can take before an incident occurs to um, harden infrastructure or to directly reduce losses that might come with the disaster. So I'll go into some examples of um, home mitigation a little later. And then preparedness is more um, kind of like a social and educational tool. So learning about the disaster and what to do. Um, so we're often, in, or if you're talking about for an agency, it's planning, training, exercises, things that we can do in advance to increase our odds of being um, better positioned to respond to these incidents when they occur. So then if something does occur, we move into that response um, phase, which is you know, the very hectic, chaotic time when we're working very closely with our fire and law partners who are out in the field responding to whatever the incident is, um, and we are coordinating resources and information for them. And then in recovery, that's when it starts to kind of transition to a more of a steady pace. But recovery, actually, these diagrams are always a little bit um, not exactly accurate because they show as if each phase is equal, where recovery is actually the longest phase often because it takes years and years and years for a community to get from where it was before a disaster um, back up to something similar, a completely normal or totally rebuilt um, community. So recovery is a very long phase and the state is in recovery from a number of disasters. The 2017 fires are still very much recovering from um, in the Santa Rosa area. There's a lot of rebuilding still to be done from the Thomas fire in Ventura. Um, so throughout this cycle, in preparedness, what our roles are is that we're the liaisons with the local government. So when something's not going on, on a daily basis, I will go um, and sit with the counties that I'm assigned to or other entities. Like I also work uh, directly with universities and schools because in a prior position, I worked as an emergency manager at Cal State Northridge actually. So I have um, a lot of experience in that sector. So we work with these entities beforehand to help with their emergency planning or <coughs> what we call an exercise where um, it's a scenario for a disaster. So maybe it's an earthquake or they want to do um, hazmat scenario or active shooter. We'll come in and we'll help out with them um, to, to help their staff understand what those processes will look like during an actual event. So we'll go to their exercises, we'll go to any trainings, any just uh, coordination workshops, because in emergency management we always say it's better to meet each other before a disaster happens than to be meeting someone for the first time while all the craziness is ensuing. Um, and participating in community events, so like this today, um, working with the community in whatever type of um, emergency, disaster, hazards-oriented workshops that um, the community puts together. Um, and then we also, during an emergency, typically what we do is we'll go and physically respond to a county's emergency operations center. So I've done that a few times for Ventura. Um, I've also gone out to Riverside County. Um, the County of Los Angeles has their emergency operations center kind of near Cal State LA, if you know where that is. Um, and that'll be the central coordination point for the county uh, when something happens. And then when we are uh, physically present in those county EOCs, we also pass information up the chain to Sacramento, um, to the governor's office, who is always really, really, especially our new government, governor, um, wanting to know what's going on throughout the state and make sure that we are um, leaning forward and ahead of the curve to be able to provide any state level resources that the local entities might um, need. So then we also will be partnering with FEMA. So in these past few years, we've had FEMA come out for, gosh, I think like four different big incidents where we've had major presidential declarations, which is a lot more than we had had in years um, before that. Um, so our goal is then to work with FEMA as they come out into our state and to be 
kind of like we do with grant funding, where the pass through for some of these disaster funds. So we try to be always connected at the hip with our FEMA counterparts when we're uh, moving into that recovery phase and trying to get funds for uh, local government for disaster recovery. We also assist with debris removal. That's a big project that we've taken on our um, Caller Cycle, one of the agencies for the state. They're actually leaders and experts in removing some of this fire debris now. After all the incidents that we've gone through in the past five years or so, um, that is a big resource that can be provided to assist the local governments and the communities after a disaster um, because the debris removal is a huge, huge project. Uh, so that's one of the big things we do to help. So some of the things um, I think I've already touched on that we've been really active in the last few years, I'm sure you guys have heard about um, November 2018, the Camp Hill and Woolsey fires, those all happened on the very same day. So um, while our colleagues in Northern California were responding to the situation up in Paradise, we were down here responding to the Hill and Woolsey incidents in Ventura and Los Angeles County. So that happened concurrently. It was a little bit crazy for the state because we, our resources were spread a little bit um, thin for that, but fortunately we were able to get a major presidential declaration quickly because of that and because um, everyone could see the disaster really happening in Paradise, even though the ones down here actually impacted far, far more people in terms of numbers of evacuation because it happened in such a populous area. Um, the one in Paradise obviously was very devastating for that small community. And then um, the, the night before that, we also had the borderline shooting incident that occurred in Thousand Oaks. Um, so in Ventura County, I, I had already been up there and there all night, the night before the fire started, and it was really um, a very unique situation because a lot of the first responders had also been up all night dealing with that mass shooting incident and then the next day we had these Santa Ana conditions and the two wildfires start within the same hour in Ventura County. So unfortunately we were able to pull in resources from neighboring counties and make sure that um, everyone was taken care of. Um, the Holy Fire, that was a pretty big one that we had in Riverside and Orange County last summer. I had mentioned the Thomas incident from December 2017, very large wildfire. And in those December 17 um, time frame, we had just the most extreme wildfire weather I think that had been seen in, in quite some time in Southern California. And we had uh, this firestorm with a couple of fires, the Rye, the Creek, the Lilac, the Zapulveta, all taking place um, in that very same week, that first week in December 2017. And then, as a result of that, we saw a very devastating mudslide incident in Montecito in Santa Barbara County um, in January of 2018. So these are all major, major incidents, and they've all taken place in just 17 and 18, um, so the last couple of years. So these are things that have really kept us busy. These are the type of scenarios that I'm really glad to see um, you guys convening to prepare for in advance of anything like that happening here. Okay, so I'm going to get into a little bit of um, some suggestions from our perspective um, at the state level of things that the community can do to assist throughout the different phases of the cycle. So one resource that Cal OES has is a mapping tool called Know Your Hazards. Um, my, myhazards.caloes.ca.org is a map that you can, or not, not work, dot gov. <laughs> Um, go on and you can type in your address and then you can see what are the hazards that are in your area that you should think about um, preparing for as a priority. And probably in this area is mostly going to be wildfires and earthquakes. Throughout most of Southern California, really those are kind of the major hazards. Of course, um, depending on where you are exactly, flooding or mudslides also might be um, big hazards. Some areas could be could have tsunami, which is infrequent, but something that's important to think about if you live in the coast or visit the coast. Um, so I would recommend just checking that out so you can kind of see where you are in position to maybe different fault lines or liquefaction zones. And a liquefaction zone would be an area where the soil and the sediment um, would be prone to more damages and uh, more intense shaking in the event of an earthquake. So these, this map can show you um, where you live in proximity to those things. And then take steps to prepare your family in advance. So um, if you had a chance to visit any of the back tables beforehand or after this, there are some tips um, for things that you might need in terms of supplies. Um, 
we always, our kind of catchphrase for this is to build a kit, make a plan, and stay informed. It's definitely making sure you have enough water, food, lighting sources, um, communication tools in your emergency kit. Um, and then another thing that's really important is to know your community. So it's really great to see so many people coming out here today because having those local connections in your community and knowing what your local resources are, knowing your neighbors on your block, knowing you know who might need extra help, maybe somebody in your neighborhood is a doctor or um, has some type of uh, construction type skills that could come in handy after an incident. Knowing that in advance can really help you out. Just like in the disaster world where we, we don't want to meet each other during an emergency, well, you, you probably don't want to be meeting your neighbor for the first time in that situation either. So getting to know your local community is something that we really encourage. And then signing up for emergency notifications is really important. Um, and while there are technologies to send alerts over cell phones during an emergency, um, that has that's a step that has to be taken by the government and the phone systems have to be working properly. And sometimes not all the messages get through with that. And it, it, it is also something that people can turn off on their phones. Um, so in addition to the, that, which is kind of like an amber alert, if you've ever had the amber alert, that's what the wireless emergency alert that we try to use during disasters is like. Um, I also encourage you to don't just rely on that, but also sign up for emergency notifications through your local government. So LA County has a system, alert.lacounty.gov, that you can sign up for if you haven't yet. And then you'll have options to receive a text, a phone call, an email. So that way there's there's multiple ways that you can be reached with really important information um, by the trusted source of your local government. And some of your local cities might have their own system too. I'm not super familiar, so check with, with your local officials at the city level too. And then also knowing trusted information sources. Um, if anybody uses Twitter, it's a really great source of real-time information during disasters because it's just so quick. Um, it's updated just in real time, and you can go on there, and if you know in advance who to trust, what sources, um, local news stations, or if your local governments, I know LA County Fire has a Twitter account that they're always posting the most recent information about fires as they occur. So following those um, accounts in advance, and you can even create like a list on your account um, for disaster information is a really good idea. And then of course also knowing your local media channels, knowing um, local radio that would be providing news in an emergency, so KNX 1070 is a good one. Um, I also want to mention radio because I saw some amateur radio um, information back there, so you have a local group doing that. Um, radio is a really great method of emergency communication because uh, it's very resilient. Some of these other methods, you know, our internet, our cell phones, even TV stations can get blocked out during a disaster depending on what happens to the infrastructure. So knowing your local radio station to tune into or having amateur radio skills is really important. And then um, during an emergency, so while something's happening, what we recommend for the community be ready to go. So have, have a kit ready to go if you live in a wildfire evacuation area. Um, and even, you know, we've seen the, some of the fire in Santa Rosa and in Ventura come into areas where people wouldn't necessarily think that they were exposed to a wildfire hazard because it looked, you know, pretty suburban. It wasn't right up against the mountainside. Um, but being ready to go because these fires are coming more and more into our communities and having some supplies that you can take with you um, if that were to happen in your area is really something that we recommend. Um, for earthquakes, knowing in advance what is the proper um, thing to do that's, that's going to keep you the safest during an earthquake. So I know when I was growing up, um, we were always told to run to doorways. Well, that is not something that is recommended anymore. The doorway is not any more structurally sound than anywhere else in the room. And often you have the doors going like this while the earthquake's happening. So you can actually get um, more injured by running to a doorway. Also, if you think about how many people are in the room today, and we all try to run to a couple of doorways here, it's not gonna work. Um, and you often have windows near doors too, and windows are a hazard that you wanna try to get away from if you have um, time to move during an earthquake. Um, the, so if you think about that in the sequence of drop, cover, and hold on, um, drop is the first step there. So you want to try to get to the ground once you start to feel shaking because the earthquake can be so violent it can throw you to the ground. So it's a lot better to try to move to the ground safely um, by your own uh, initiative than to be thrown to the ground by the earthquake. And then 
to cover. So the most important part is your head. You want to try to cover your head and neck. Um, you might not have an ideal table that you could get under, but even a chair or something small that could fit your head and neck under it um, is going to help, or just covering it, your head and neck with your arms if there isn't anything nearby. Um, and then staying, hold on while the shaking continues, and if it's a large earthquake, it can continue for you know, 30, 45 seconds, which will feel like a very, very long time. And then, of course, following the evacuation instructions from local officials. Um, we, we take evacuations very seriously, and we will not be issuing evacuations um, if it's not necessary, if it's not for your safety. So please do follow instructions from local officials if they do issue evacuations in your area. Um, and then have a family communications plan. That's really important. I mentioned radios. Um, you know, having an out-of-state contact is something that's still recommended because local systems can be overloaded in, in these disasters. And sometimes it's actually easier to reach people out of state. So having a family out-of-state contact designated, um, maybe using text messages instead of trying to call Text messages have been shown to go through a lot more um, easily because they're, they're not as taxing on the system as a phone call. You don't have to use it for the same amount of time. Knowing uh, where the family will meet up is really important. So having that plan within your family, thinking about your pets, if you have pets, how will you evacuate your pets? And then, like we're doing today, attending town halls and meetings to participate. So usually during wildfires or other big incidents, um, your local officials and your um, government agencies will try to convene meetings so that they can provide information directly to the community and hear from the community what are the most pressing needs. So um, being an active member of your community and participating in those um, is something that, that we really recommend. And then um, recovery. So after the disaster, um, the fire is contained, but now we have all these damages to deal with and life is not really back to normal for people right away. So some of the things that you can do and um, know in advance to prepare for recovery, take a look at your insurance policy information. It's been something not just in California, but across the country we've really seen as um, a big issue lately in emergency management for um, individuals is that a lot of people are underinsured. Um, if, if you got the insurance when you bought your house, it may have been some time ago, and to rebuild your house to today's standards in today's economy may be a lot more expensive than what you have coverage for. And we've seen this a lot in Ventura County from the fires. Um, so knowing that in advance, taking a look at your insurance policy, um, and then also thinking about things like flood insurance and earthquake insurance, which are not typically part of an insurance policy, um, and considering whether or not that is a good investment for you before a disaster will really help out because while the federal government can provide some resources, insurance is always the first line defense. After a disaster, your local governments will also convene what's known as local assistance centers, and if FEMA is involved, they'll convene a disaster recovery center, um, and that will be all kinds of different resources from different levels of government um, in one place, so like a one-stop shop to help you get back on your feet. So from the state level, we have um, our DMV partners come out and they'll help to take a photo and reprint your driver's license right there if you lost that um, in the disaster. We have information on getting tax returns that you might have lost in the disaster or um, other important documents like birth certificates, marriage certificates, and um, also information about um, dealing with contractors for rebuilding. Um, so all those type of resources can be found in one of these centers. If FEMA is involved, if we do have a presidential declaration, we always recommend people to, to register for FEMA because it is usually only provided for 60 days after the disaster. And um, you might not find out from your insurance until after 60 days and then you would wish that you had registered for FEMA. So um, the small business assistance loans are also available and those are not just for businesses. They have a whole disaster recovery branch um, that can help uh, individuals with low interest loans after disaster. And then we also usually have a lot of help from nonprofit um, organizations after disasters, the American Red Cross, um, groups like the United Way, Suchi, the Salvation Army. And then maybe it's a disaster that didn't impact you directly, um, but you want help, which we see in a lot of disasters, including the most recent Midwest floods. Um, so donating time and money, 
time or money um, to help out in these disaster situations because donating goods, physical goods, material goods, is something that um, the disaster responders then usually have to sort and deal with, um, which oftentimes they're not the things that the survivors really need. So um, I always try to encourage people to think about that, that uh, the financial resources or going and volunteering with survivors is always a better option than just sending stuff because it may not be the right kind of stuff. Um, the Southern California Earthquake Center has developed some really, really great outreach materials for earthquake preparedness and a lot of that can be found on their website, earthquakecountry.org. So um, also shakeout.org, if you've heard of the great shakeout, this is a, a really great website. Every year we try to get everyone to participate in an earthquake drill in October. So that's a drop, cover, and hold on, and practice what happens, um, what you should do during an earthquake. So securing your space against non-structural earthquake hazards is really important. So non-structural would be like things that are on your shelves, um, pictures, mirrors on the wall, anything that could fall when the shaking happens, even your television. I know things that, that are really heavy, we don't think about it really moving, but the earthquake really can be quite violent, and it can not just, you, you don't need to think just that these items are gonna fall, but they can become projectiles. They can actually be thrown across the room. So that's why it's important to protect yourself in advance by making sure these objects are secured. Uh, so there's lots of different methods for doing that for um, small breakable objects. There's a museum putty that you can stick under those to um, make sure that they'll stay on those shelves when the shaking happens. There's proper ways that are recommended to hang your pictures and mirrors on the wall. Um, and then looking at some structural mitigation as well. So making sure the foundation of your home is bolted or your home is bolted to the foundation beforehand. And then uh, looking into any seismic retrofits that might help, especially if your home was built um, in like the 50s or the 60s. So these are some mitigation things that you can think about now. So this stuff's really important. That is my email, my cell phone, and also my Twitter. So um, thank you so much for having me this morning. Next, uh, we uh, uh, are happy to have our LA County Fire uh, Battalion Chief, Alvin Brewer, and Assistant Chief uh, Jay Lopez to give a presentation. Yeah, we want to thank the Assemblyman for, uh, and all the local officials for uh, inviting us here to talk to you all about uh, fire prevention, fire and safety. When we have a major incident, law enforcement, OAS, Southern California Edison, we all join together and we manage this incident in unified command. We all have a vested interest in your safety. But what I'd like to talk about today is that partnership. We'd like for you to partnership with us in order to keep you safe. Whenever we have a major incident, our priorities with, the, with, the, with your local fire department is very simple. We want to protect life, property, and the environment through incident stabilization. So how do we do that? We're going to mobilize our equipment, our resources, to come and help you in your time of need by being regionally staffed. Here locally, we've got uh, Engine 53. They're uh, over here on the uh, Coast Highway. They've got a fire, one fire engine at their station. Uh, up on the top of the hill, Station 56, Rowan Hills. They've got one fire engine in their station. Over on the east side, over in uh, Mirror Lest, Rancho Palos Verdes, Station 83 has a paramedic assessment engine and a patrol. Uh, station 106 over in Rolling Hills Estates has a fire engine, a paramedic squad, a Quint, which is a big fire truck with the uh, white ladder on the top. Station 2 over in uh, Palos Verdes Estates has a fire engine and a paramedic squad. And over in Lomita, Station 6 has a fire engine and a paramedic squad. So what happens in a brush fire? Your local fire department, LA County Fire Department, has one of the most robust responses in the world. We will come to you on a first alarm brush assignment with seven fire engines, four camp crews, three superintendents, three helicopters, a dozer team, a water tender, a patrol, a paramedic squad. Seasonally, we'll have the super scoopers, Quebec one and two, a helitanker, we send two battalion chiefs. Also, we have over 120 personnel immediately dispatched for your brush fire. So what does that look like? 
that, that's a lot of numbers for equipment. And as you guys can tell, our fire engines and our fire trucks and our, our, our patrols, our squads, they're big heavy equipment. So while we're coming in to respond to your emergency, to your brush fire, we need a lot of access to get in. When you're told to evacuate, when it's time to get out, please do because it helps us get in to fight that fire. I got a question earlier about buying equipment to stay and protect uh, your homes yourselves, and I don't recommend that. I would rather you let the professionals do that. We are a paid professional fire service that trains every day to protect you. But what we do is dangerous. Even though we train every day, we still have injuries. We still have deaths of firefighters. We don't want you guys putting yourselves in danger. Let us do that. If you get into a situation where you decided not to evacuate when asked, and now you need, it's overwhelming and you need rescue, well that takes us away from the firefight, away from police suppression, into a rescue because again, our first priority is life. So now we have to make sure that we go in to rescue you and we're not putting those resources that you fight the fire. So we talked about our helicopters. We were the first fire department in the world to start using fire hawks. Basically what a fire hawk is, is a Black Hawk from the, uh, from the military. The military uses these Black Hawk helicopters and we've taken, we bought five of them and we've adjusted them to be able to help us to fight fire. They can drop up to a thousand gallons of water on, on one cycle. So we talk about our camp crews. We've got two types of camp crews. All of our camp crews are well trained and highly skilled and they are usually some of the first ones in and the last ones out. The department staffs 27 camp crews daily. They consist of uh, 8 to 14 crew members on each crew and a fire crew supervisor. Their responsibility is to remove any unburned fuel from the fire's ridge so that the fire does not become larger. Once the fire is out, they assist the mop up, pulling holes, floods, sandbagging, rescues. We want to make sure that once that fire is out that it doesn't rekindle. Some of our crews, some of our paid crews, uh, are flight crews. Basically what happens is they'll come in on the helicopters, they'll be sat down on the ridge, and then they'll engage the fire from there. So what do you do when the wildfire threatens? There's a few things. You want to prepare. You want to leave early. Some of you may think that you want to stay and defend. Again, I, I want to stress that that's not the smartest thing to do. You, you want to think about when a fire comes, there's super hot gases. Uh, there's a lot of loud noise. There are, uh, it's a very stressful environment. And if you've never been, if you've never been in a situation like that, and you think that you're gonna be able to stay and, and defend, defend your home, and you haven't properly prepared yourself, you haven't properly trained, if you're not in the best physical condition, don't even take the chance. <laughs> Certainly you wanna leave with it. <laughs> you know, how do you harden your home? You know, things like clearing your brush from around your, your uh, buildings and your 100 foot of clearance, which we'll be doing, we'll be starting that next month. But in addition to that, uh, some box thieves uh, in, around your homes. Look at the uh, furniture that you have, your patio furniture, your lawn furniture. You know, things like wicker furniture are easily caught on fire when there's ember cast. You know, typically when you have a fire, a lot of times it's pushed by the wind. Well, we know that we've got a lot of winds that come here off the peninsula anyway. And so if you've got a fire and those winds are coming, and you've got some flammable materials just outside your home, that's just more fuel. Prepare your wildfire action plan. So make sure that you guys get one of those uh, pamphlets, the Ready, Set, Go pamphlet. In addition to that, we have it on our website, fire.lacounty.gov website also has a Ready, Set, Go plan that you can download. That pamphlet will allow you to put together a plan. The assembly member, he talked about Palos Verdes being an island with three bridges. Well, if you, as I ride around a lot of the neighborhoods, I find that the neighborhoods are even further isolated. And so in order to get to those three bridges, we typically only have one or two ways to get out of our neighborhoods to get to that main thoroughfare. So you need to have a backup plan.
So it's not just good enough to have that initial plan of, you know, I'm going to go out to Granby, Altamira, and then over to Hawthorne, and then I can make it down out to the cities of Lord Run. You may have to have another route. If the fire is encroaching on your um, encroaching on your route of egress, then you need to have another route, another plan. So don't only put together one plan, put together two or three, and practice these plans. It's like they said, it's not the time of emergency. It's not the time to find out how effective your plan is. Uh, time yourself. Look how long it takes you to get all of those things together and get into your car and to actually drive to a place of uh, safety. Responsibility is on you for your safety, but again, I just want to stress that it's a partnership. Prepare for survival. Are you physically fit to fight fires in and around your home for up to 10 hours or more? Are you and your family mentally, physically, and emotionally able to cope with intense smoke, heat, stress, and noise of a brush fire while defending your home? Do you have the necessary resources and equipment to effectively fight a fire? When they say that, a lot of us have garden hoses. <laughs> That's just not going to cut it. Do you have the defensible space of at least 200 feet? Is your home constructed to resist fire? If you answer no to any of these questions, plan to leave early. We've got our, sheriff's, our partners from the Sheriff's Department. When they ask you to evacuate, please do so. We will keep your home safe. Some things that as you start to evacuate, if you, if you should become trapped in your car, uh, these are some of the things that you can think about. Uh, try to drive to an area clear of vegetation. If you're on a road, do not park on an intern. So what is an intern? As you drive around the peninsula here, if your car is headed towards, say, the ocean, if the turn is going towards the ocean, that's an out turn. As you drive, if your turn is, if your car is headed towards the hillside, that's an intern. So why is that significant? Well, these interns are the areas where heated gases and fire are funneled up. So as the winds kind of traverse through the hillsides, they're funneled and pushed upwards on these interns. We call them chimneys. And you don't want to get caught on one of those with fire below you and, and coming out. You want to close all your windows and keep your doors unlocked. Why do you want to keep your doors unlocked? Because should you get trapped and we respond, we can get your car door open, but we're going to try before we pry. And it's just quicker and easier if it's already unlocked to be able to get that door open for you and get you out of there quickly. Turn your air conditioner on and keep it in the recirculation or max mode. Cover yourself with a wool or cotton blanket. Call 911 and notify the dispatcher of your location. Wait for the fire front to pass. There will probably be smoke in your car. Do not attempt to outrun a wildfire. Again, stay in defense should be considered only as a last resort. Remember, each year, professionally trained firefighters are killed fighting, fighting wildfires. Citizens also perish during these events. To increase your chance of survival, you must be trained and equipped. So you want to make informed decisions based on your training level, your physical abilities, known fire conditions, past fire history in the area, and fire behavior predictions. If you're not adept at all that, then just leave early. Dress appropriately, wear long sleeves, long pants, cotton or wool, and closed toe sturdy boots, no synthetics. The last major fire happened in uh, 2008 over here in Portuguese Bend. It happened on a Thursday night, about eight o'clock. These things don't always happen at ideal times. They, they, they won't always happen in the morning. And so at a moment's notice, you're getting calls from law enforcement to get out, to evacuate. And so now you should have that plan already rehearsed. Thank you, Chief. I, I wanted to make sure that we had, you know, our uh, Edison electricity provider uh, participate in this because not only uh, are they an important partner in terms of the communication, but also as, as we're seeing um, throughout the state, uh, at least one out of every 10 uh, fires in, in California are, are caused by the electricity grid. And so, uh, but here to talk about uh, all of that is uh, Tom Jacobus. Appreciate the opportunity to, to be here to speak to you all today. I work in the company's business resiliency organization. We're involved in all these different things around the, the ring. Uh, 
um, this business resiliency where we're 10 miles wide and two miles deep in terms of the our involvement throughout the company so you know from a business impact analysis of identifying what are the what are the key parts of the company uh, that we need to, to bring back uh, electricity the most quickly and how do we prepare those what plans do we need to put in place uh, looking at protecting our most critical infrastructure uh, at the transmission level uh, making sure that we have uh, good incident response teams and, and executable response plans they're not the door stops that are this thick that nobody ever reads uh, how do you make them action oriented um, doing assessment and mitigation disaster recovery which you know for us it's a, it's a term of art that's used uh, of recovering our electronic systems that we use to run our our grid and run our company you know if we lose those how do we bring them back as quickly as we can and how do we operate manually until we bring them back uh, continuity of operations so if we lose an operation center uh, in one particular area, you know, how do we transfer over to another so it's seamless? Uh, Cybersecurity is something we're always concerned about. Uh, crisis communications. So when we're experiencing an emergency, who do we need to talk to? How do we need to talk to them? Uh, when do we need to talk to them? How often? What do we need to say? You know, employee and family preparedness. So we have a big disaster. We have a big 7.8 on the San Andreas Fault. Well, our employees are human beings, just like everybody here is. Uh, how do we get, and they all have families, how do we get them to come to work? The continuity of our business. So there's getting the power back on, and then there are you know, all the employees and systems and processes we have in place uh, to operate as an ongoing business concern. How do we bring those back as quickly as we can with minimal interruption after a major emergency? So preparedness at SCE, planning, <laughs> organizing, uh, training and equipping, exercising, and then evaluating and improving. Uh, we train our employees the same way the fire department trains theirs uh, on incident management so that we can uh, seamlessly uh, plug in during an emergency. It's clear that, that they know who's in charge at Edison, who's managing the incident, uh, and that way we're able to work uh, very closely together. We have about 550 um, Edison employees that are rostered to these incident management teams uh, these teams are issued uh, a number of different communication devices. There are these govern government emergency telephone system cards. It's a special code that bypasses the normal telephone system should it become overwhelmed in an emergency. So they get those. They also get these 900 megahertz uh, walkie-talkie radios uh, that are on the Edison radio system. They're also issued uh, satellite communication devices, uh, satellite phones, so that you know, if the worst if the worst happens, uh, we're sure that we can we can talk to each other and coordinate. Get a formal corrective action process. So it's not just evaluating our existing plans and looking for holes or ways we can improve. We're actually evaluating their individual performance. We've also established a critical lifelines organization because you know, we tend to be the long pole in the tent if you get the euphemism, uh, when it comes to recovering the other critical infrastructures. So some of the things that, that we contemplate, you know, there are, there are local, uh, local type incidents, uh, things that are really either handled at the city or, or at the county level, um, at the state, you know, the, the complexity goes up. So the way our, our plans are designed, uh, so that we design them to actually be used, so they're, they're integrated with our normal day-to-day -day procedures. So day-to-day -day procedures handle 90% uh, of what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. A, a circuit goes out, or um, you know, we, we have a problem at a, at a particular facility, to you know, tactical plans where you know, a particular organization unit within Edison is enough to, to handle uh, what may be going on, to operational, uh, level plans where we may need multiple entities from within our company uh, as well as outside the company to deal with the problem uh, as well as you know strategic plans you know overall of how to how do you how do you mobilize a company of 13,000 people to to reorient them so that they are all laser focused uh, on resolving the problem uh, another thing that we have in place is uh, we have pretty robust system of mutual assistance where 
you know, we could call San Diego Gas and Electric or Los Angeles Department of Water and Power if we needed uh, additional resources on the ground. So I'm working from the bottom up. So if we needed additional help, uh, we have a mechanism to get that. Uh, again, if we get into something that's really awful uh, and we've exhausted the resources within California, we can go to the Western states, which is uh, curated by the, the Western um, Energy Institute. And then if it's something where we still need more resources, uh, we can reach out nationally to, to every uh, investor-owned utility in the, in the United States. So because we're in California and there are so many hazards uh, present, it's a beautiful place to live, but there are many hazards from high fire hazard risk areas to earthquakes, landslides, uh, et cetera. We have a pretty robust uh, hazard assessment and mitigation plan where we are uh, a couple of years into our, our seismic mitigation plan where we are looking at exactly which facilities need to be hardened, uh, exactly which points within facilities need to be hardened. Uh, we've not only got the infrastructure down in the valley here, but our service territory is about 50,000 square miles, which is like the state of Alabama. And there are you know, many different... Um, many different areas of geographic features. So from up in the Sierras, where we had you know, a couple of years ago, 200% of normal snowpack that uh, was all melting at the same time to, um, to you know, landslide risk, fire risk. Uh, so we've got programs in place to oversee all those investments uh, to make sure that we're, we're uh, putting the money where it's needed the money. Uh, some of the preparedness um, capabilities that we have now so we've got you know, pretty robust uh, evacuation procedures that we test every year. Uh, it's company-wide. All 13,000 employees are evacuated and accounted for uh, because that's something that we know is, is going to be very important at the worst possible time. Of to, it's a challenge just knowing where everybody is. Uh, before you can get them to a place and focus them on a common set of objectives to achieve, you got to know where they are. We've got an emergency notification system which can reach out and ping our employees at home, uh, send them a text, send them an email, um, phone call, etc. Um, our, our teams and our field people have been equipped with uh, what we call go bags, which are just backpacks that are um, equipped with water, um, gloves, uh, flashlights, um, radios, that sort of thing. Uh, we've done home preparedness campaigns. We need to make sure that our, our employees and their families are as prepared as possible uh, so that they can come back to work it, it, you know, as quickly as we can get them. So one of the things that we've invested in uh, over the last two years, and it's sort of a term of art, situation awareness. Um, how to maintain a, a common picture of, of what our environment is doing around us. Um, in particular, uh, for, for wildfire, uh, we've installed a number of weather stations throughout our service territory. We've gone into the weather business. Uh, you can see those weather stations and the information is publicly available at uh, mesowest.org. We've installed, I think, about 70 uh, cameras on various mountaintops that the fire agencies have access to. The idea is that hey, if, if a wildfire does start, um, they may be able to get one of those super scoopers after it, you know, before it has a smoke column that looks like uh, Mount Vesuvius just let go. Um, and, you know, in keeping with weather modeling, so we're buying a supercomputer. I don't know what it looks like. I've told you it's purple and has flames on it. Um, but its primary function is going to be. Uh, modeling and crunching um, all this weather data uh, to help us better forecast uh, when we are going to be in a high fire situation. If you're looking for a good bellwether uh, right now, figure out where, where you might need to perk your ears up and, and pay a little bit more attention. There's a, a, an indices out there called the Santa Ana Wildfire Threat Index, not published by Edison. Uh, it's something that we watch. Uh, red flag is pretty good. That's issued by the National Weather Service, but that we found um, through our study that it's a little bit too blunt of an instrument for us to use. Uh, Santa Ana Wildfire Threat Index, or the SAT, pretty good. If you see that arrow pointing to elevated or high, um, 
you can be sure that we're all paying attention and standing around it, watching it, wringing our hands. Uh, so I've got a couple links, which if, if anybody's interested, um, you can see me afterwards. I can give you the links. You can view the cameras. Uh, they can see for miles and miles. Uh, we're installing more this year. Uh, we installed 125 weather stations last year. We get another 315 this year, and uh, 410 by 2020 or so. But anyways, all this data and, and more from our from our cyber security center, from our physical security centers, from our grid control centers, filter into this uh, group that we call our watch office. And just like the name implies, they are watching 24 hours a day, seven days a week for things that are off normal. Um, and to what degree they're off normal. And there's a, a whole escalation process in determining how complex is the problem that one group may be experiencing, uh, and that determines whether or not we activate our emergency operations center. Did you go to the next one? Uh, so I mentioned, in, you know, we, we sort of embraced these public uh, sector frameworks for uh, preparedness and response. Um, you know, we use the incident command system uh, to manage emergencies. Same system the fire department uses, the same roles, same responsibilities, uh, same training, same terminology. Um, so it really helps us, you know, even though we, we may have never met, I could show up anywhere at one of these fire camps and no longer be a lost ball in tall grass. I could say, I'm looking for your incident commander, or I'm looking for your liaison officer, and I know exactly what to expect from that person, I know what their role is, uh, it really speeds the communication and coordination. Uh, this is an example of an earthquake exercise we did in 2017. Uh, we did cyber and physical security last year. Uh, this year we're back to earthquake again because it's something we can never take our uh, eye off the ball on. And you know, while we're sort of a quasi uh, private sector entity, we're you know a private for-profit company uh, living in a very public sector world, um, we know we're going to have to integrate and coordinate with with many different agencies and entities. So when we do these full-scale exercises, we invite all the alphabet soup agencies from Washington, D.C. We invite L.A. County Fire, uh, Office of Emergency Management, because we want them to be familiar with how, we're, how we operate and what the nuances uh, are that we have to deal with. Um, and we want to know what we can expect from them. So they're, they're pretty realistic scenarios. Uh, I had somebody pull me aside the, the full-scale exercises go on for a full day um, where we give you know, our incident management teams uh, a year's worth of problems to solve uh, in eight hours. And I had somebody pull me aside once and say, during one of these, and say, you know, this is pretty intense. Um, does it really have to be all day long? I said, what I think I just heard you say is I'm doing and my team are doing a great job. Uh, that you're that you're that stressed out, you're tired by the end of the day. That just tells me we're doing it right. Um, and I mentioned we, you know, we measure, uh, we measure everything. You know, what were the performance of the individual teams? Um, how did we do in the exercise? What was the feedback we received from either the public utility commission, who we also invite, uh, or the public sector uh, entities? So I think that's that's my last slide, but I wanted to give you a broad brush about things that we do, the things that we're concerned about, things that keep us up at night, uh, how we prepare and how we plan. Thank you. And before we wrap up this edition of Around the Peninsula, I want to let everyone know that you can always log on to the city's website for emergency planning information. Log on to rpvca.gov. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.